Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is our gospel lesson for this morning. Before the sermon, I'll just reread verse 21 of Matthew 1. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the only name under heaven by which we must be saved, dear Christian friends. Well, as I look out on you this morning, knowing most of your names, I see at least a couple of you that are in the same boat as my daughter Sonia, at least when it comes to like, going to an amusement park, going to a museum, and then going into the gift shop and coming up to that one section in the gift shop where they have all the personalized gifts. You never find anything with your name on it. Most of you are on the other side of the equation, though. You, you can go in there and you can find something with your name on because your name is a common enough name that they went ahead and printed the coffee mugs and the bookmarks and what have you. That's kind of a big deal when you're a little kid. You walk in somewhere and you see your name on something. You're like, wow, they knew I was coming and they knew I just wanted to spend $4.95 on a coffee mug with my name on it. But Jesus was not an uncommon name. If they had personalized gift shops in Palestine in that day and age, there would have been gifts that had Jesus, uh, Yeshua, on. It was a common name. That's why when he performed his ministry on earth, he was known as Jesus of Nazareth to set him apart from all the other Jesuses or Yeshuas that there would have been wandering around out there. But it wasn't an accident, of course, that he had that name. His name had meaning. And yes, our names have meaning too. You know, you, maybe you've taken the time to look up what your name actually means. And that what your name means may, may or may not have anything to do with who you really are in life. Most likely your parents picked out your name because it had some family meaning to it or it just sounded good. They say that when you're picking out a kid's name, one of the things you can do is throw open your back door and shout the name out because you're going to be shouting at your kid plenty throughout their life anyway, so you might as well test it out and see how it sounds. Maybe that's how your parents picked out your name. But Jesus' name was picked out because he was going to live up to the meaning of that name. And not just the meaning of the name. That's spelled out very clearly by the angel. Yeshua means deliverer. Deliverer, one who saves. You think of Joshua in the Old Testament. That was the same name. He had that name. He was the one who delivered and saved Israel by God's direction from the Canaanites and, and allowed Israel to take possession of the promised land. Jesus would live up to his name as no one else could. But before we talk about the name of Jesus in more detail, there's another name we should talk about. Joseph. It's not the first time we see Joseph. The name Joseph in the Bible, of course, Joseph is named after that famous son of Jacob, Joseph. And if you were in church on Wednesday for our final midweek Advent service, we made the point that while Jacob was blessing his 12 sons, and it became clear he wasn't going to bless his first three sons with the birthright, you, it would have stood to reason that the one that he would bless ultimately would be Joseph because Joseph was the one who was most beloved by his father. Also, you know, Joseph was the best one, really. But God, in his wisdom, had decided Judah would be the one to get the birthright. Still, Joseph, very important person. His name literally means he shall add. And the first Joseph lived up to that name. He shall add. He collected all that grain during the seven years of plenty that God had told him about so that in the seven years of famine that would follow, there would be food to distribute to the needy people of the, that part of the world. And this Joseph lives up to that name too. He shall add, in a sense, I think, because he really adds to our understanding of Christmas. I don't think I could appreciate the story of Christmas, and the story of the Holy Family as much, if not for Joseph. You send out your Christmas cards, and there's a picture of Mary and Joseph and the baby, and it's always idealized. 
which, which is fine, of course. They're, they're, they're standing worshipfully at the manger, or Joseph is leading a donkey with Mary holding the baby on it as they go down to Egypt. That's only part of the story. The other part's in our text for this morning. Joseph was engaged to Mary. More than engaged, Joseph and Mary were betrothed. Engagement in our day and age isn't a legal uh, arrangement. You can break an engagement and that doesn't really mean anything legally. Betrothal was a legal arrangement in those days. And if you were going to break a betrothal, you had to go through the process of divorce. It was a big deal to get betrothed. They were betrothed. And then Joseph finds out after Mary has spent three months with her cousin Elizabeth, she comes back to Nazareth and she's pregnant. And what's he to think? Obviously, his wife-to-be has been unfaithful to him. He has the right to bring her up in front of the town council of Nazareth and have her condemned. And that con condemnation would probably mean stoning. But Joseph is a righteous man, we're told. Joseph loves Mary, doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace, so though he's humiliated, he says, I'm just going to end it quietly and move on with my life. See, we hear that Mary's going to give birth to a son. Miraculously, she accepts that word. We never find out if she tells Joseph ahead of the fact Either she does, and Joseph obviously can't believe her because that story's too ridiculous to believe. Or Mary says, I know this story's going to be too ridiculous to believe, and she doesn't bother telling Joseph in the first place. In either case, Joseph is about to divorce Mary when the angel comes to him. He says, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid, first of all, because God's done a miracle here. And this miracle is a miracle that's going to gather you and everyone else in, Joseph. This is the miracle of the Savior coming into the world. He will save his people from their sins. So you, as the person who's going to be legally regarded as the father of this child, you, Joseph, are going to give him the name Jesus. Yes, it's a common name, but only this son is going to live up to it. Only this son can actually save people from their sins. And Joseph believed. Let's not pass by too quickly what a difficult thing that would have been to believe that Mary could have become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You have to go back to our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 7 the miraculous sign that was foretold to wicked King Ahaz, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. That just doesn't happen. It's a miracle on two levels. First of all, the virgin becoming pregnant, and then the virgin giving birth to a son. Now, in this day and age, they talk about cloning but you can't clone a male inside of a female because you need a male to contribute that male chromosome. So when you talk about cloned animals, it's always a female, right? Dolly the sheep and so on. Here's a miracle on two levels. The virgin becomes pregnant. The virgin gives birth to a son. And then, not only does the angel give Joseph the name the legal name that this son is going to carry, Jesus, Yeshua, the one who delivers, the one who saves. But the angel himself reminds Joseph of that promise from Isaiah 7. The virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. It's funny, I think, sometimes how some Christians can get tripped up over the concept of the virgin birth, as if somehow that's impossible for God, when the bigger miracle is contained there in the word Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, it's a miracle for a virgin to conceive. It's a bigger miracle, I would think, to take everything that God is and have that fullness of God compressed into a little baby. 
So that that baby is God. That makes less sense to me. But that's what God said happened. And more than that, we needed that to happen. We needed that to happen because, yes, we had to have a perfect Savior. We had to have Yeshua, the one born of a woman, but also conceived by the Holy Spirit so that he could live a perfect life on our behalf underneath the laws of God. And, and Jesus obeyed every single law that was ever put on him. But we needed that Savior to be bigger than a man, too. He couldn't just be a man. He had to be God. What if Jesus had just been a man, a perfect man, and then had been crucified on a cross? Whom would he have saved? Only himself. His death wouldn't have been big enough to pay for anyone else's sins, much less the sins of the entire world. But God in the flesh being put to death? That's a big sacrifice. That's a huge sacrifice. That's a sacrifice big enough to take away everything that's wrong with you and me. And that's what's in the names that's, that are given us this morning. Jesus and Emmanuel. A Savior big enough to take away our sins. A Savior for us so that we can be sure that our names are written in God's eternal book of life. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.